So with being at the lowest point in his life, he found himself really struggling. At numerous points in that night, Jesus had tried to warn Peter that, Peter, you're not really where you think you are. But we know that Peter continued to argue with Jesus, that, no, I am ready to die with you. I'm doing better than the rest of these disciples. He argued with Jesus, but we know where the events of that night led him to. That on three separate occasions, Peter denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And in that final denial, he reverted back to Simon, the Galilean fisherman. And as he did so, he connected eyes with his Lord and saw a look that just absolutely melted him inwardly and caused him to run out into the streets of Jerusalem to weep bitter, inconsolable tears. That happened right at the brink or the dawn of a new day, because in just six hours, the Lord Jesus Christ would be crucified, hanging on a cross. But the record goes silent concerning Peter. Where was Peter at at this moment in time? We don't know until after the resurrection, when the record picks him up again. Peter had gone to the high priest's house to see the end. But having seen the end, Peter was very lost. He must have at some level had the words of his Lord echoing in his head, of where he had told him, but I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not. And I believe at this time that Peter would begin to understand why it is that his Lord had prayed for him. And he would think upon these words, these words of, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. When he realized that he couldn't rely upon his own abilities, but he needed the strength that would be afforded to him through his Lord and Master. And so in this class, what we hope to do is to take a look at those elements of conversion. When the final pieces come together in John chapter 21, of when Jesus is able to get through to Peter, And Peter makes this recognition of what it truly means to follow Jesus and what Jesus expects of him as he goes forward to lead the ecclesia. Well, on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb, only to find it empty. And when the women went into the tomb, they found that there were two angels in there. And in Mark's account, in chapter 16 and verse 7, one of the angels tells the women to go and tell Jesus' disciples and Peter. Peter is specifically called out in Mark's account of the gospel, and we wonder, why would the angels take the time to mention Peter specifically? Why not just say, well, go and tell Jesus' disciples? Clearly, that would include Peter. But no, there's a specific mention to make sure that they reach out to Peter. Well, I believe that Peter would have needed to hear this. After his vehement denial of the Lord Jesus Christ, he needed to hear that he was still a disciple of Jesus, that Jesus still needed him. Well, upon hearing this in John 20 and verse 2, we're told that he and John are off like a flash to the tomb to see what had transpired. And as we've already noted, John mentions that he was a bit of a quicker flash than Peter. And he arrives there first, but he's a bit tentative. He doesn't go in, he's looking in. And as his eyes are adjusting to the darkness, he sees that there is no body. However, the grave clothes are piled there. And while he's considering what it is that he's looking at, huffing along comes Peter. Peter doesn't stop short, but true to form, Peter goes straight into the tomb and begins looking around. And emboldened by Peter going into the tomb, John also steps in and begins to look around. But while both men were seeing the same factual information, making the same observations at a high level, they were walking away with different conclusions. Because John 20 and verse 8 tells us that John believed. But what is it that John believed? Well, if we continue reading on in verse 9, it tells us that at this point, the disciples didn't know that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. And you wonder, well, how is it that they still didn't get it? But the reality is that they didn't. And so as John sees everything, this is one of the things that Jesus loved about John was his perception. He realized that Jesus had risen from the dead. But not so with Peter. 
Because we're told in Luke chapter 24 and verse 10 that having examined the evidence, Peter departed, wondering in himself at that which had come to pass. Other versions read that he wondered what had happened. It seemed as though Peter was struggling to put all the pieces together. His Lord had died. The body was missing. The grave clothes were there. What piece was he missing? What had actually taken place? Well, we're told that as Mary Magdalene continues at the tomb, that Jesus appears to her. And she went back and told the others in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 to 11, that she had seen Jesus. And the rest of the disciples don't believe her at that point. The next account that Mark records of somebody seeing Jesus is in the very next verses, in verses 12 and 13, with the account of the two on the road to Emmaus. But in between those two events of Jesus appearing to Mary and Jesus appearing to the two on the road to Emmaus is a visit to Peter. And it's easy to miss because there's nothing recorded about the conversation that takes place other than the fact that it did take place. In Luke 24 and verse 34, when the two rush back to go to Jerusalem to tell the rest of the disciples, this is what they report in verse 34. They say, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon, indicating that Jesus had spoken to Simon Peter before he had spoken to them. And so this is really supported as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 5 of where Paul records that Peter first saw Jesus before the rest of the disciples saw Jesus. What an amazing encounter this must have been. But just imagine, just imagine for a moment what this would have meant for Peter and the significance that this would have had for him. Jesus knew that Peter needed special attention. After the events that had taken place, he knew that Peter was still not in a great place. But Peter needed to know that nothing had changed from his Lord's perspective. That Jesus still needed him to be the rock of the early ecclesia. And that he had forgiven him for what had taken place. Imagine the words that would have been exchanged and the exchange of emotion between these two men. The deficiency wasn't on the Lord's side. It was on Peter's side. Peter had to be willing to accept and to believe that he had been forgiven. Isn't that the case for us as well, brothers and sisters? As we fail and as we falter and as we have deficiencies of where we sin, that nothing changes from God's perspective, that God is true to his word and he's willing to forgive us if we are willing to repent to return to Him and to truly believe that we can be forgiven. All we can do is imagine what was communicated between Jesus and Peter. And you wonder if Peter reflected on this conversation as he recorded the words of 1 Peter 4 and verse 8, of where he says that love covers a multitude of sins. And God has seen it fit and appropriate in our day to cover the details of that conversation other than letting us know that it took place. Perhaps now, Peter would begin to appreciate the development of compassion that that uncompassionate servant, the unforgiving servant, had had before because he didn't recognize his inherent need of the Lord's forgiveness, that patience wouldn't suffice for him to be able to repay all. It was an insurmountable amount of debt. And now Peter would begin to appreciate that and to be able to develop compassion for others. Well, Jesus then appears to the other disciples, minus Thomas, in John chapter 20, verses 19 to 24. And eight days after this, it's recorded in John 20, verses 26 to 29, that he appeared to all of them again, this time including Thomas. This was now the third time that Peter had seen Jesus, and the second time that he had appeared to the rest of the disciples. Well, after this, Matthew tells us in chapter 28 and verse 16 that the disciples traveled from Jerusalem to the north up into the region of Galilee because Jesus told them that he was going to meet them there. 
And this is where we pick up in the account at John chapter 21, if we could turn there. This is where we'll be spending the rest of our time together. <clears throat> in John chapter 21 and verse 1, we're told that Jesus is now going to appear again to his disciples. And we're reminded in verse 14 of John chapter 21 that this is the third time that he's now appearing to the rest of the disciples. The fourth time for Peter, but the third time for the rest of them. Some of the disciples are listed in verse 2. And once again, Simon Peter is listed first. And we can think, okay, so he's listed first again. But I think that this emphasizes a very important point. That despite Peter's failings, that the disciples still look to him as the lead. And that the divine record still accounts Peter as the leader of his brethren. Well, Peter, the night prior in verse 3, as we're told, suggests that they should go fishing. And the others decide that they're going to go with him. They toil all night and catch nothing. Morning comes, and in verse 4, Jesus is waiting on the shore for them to return. They don't yet know that this is Jesus, but Jesus initiates the discussion with them. We're told about how far off they were, about 200 cubits. That's the length of about a football field, something I'm sure that we can appreciate down in Texas. But it was far enough away in the morning to not really be able to identify who Jesus was. But Jesus initiates the conversation. Jesus says, children, have ye any meat? As he yells across the water. And the word that he uses for children is pedion, which means little children, even down to infants. This would have seemed like a curious way to address seasoned fishermen who were fully grown men. But Jesus was asking if they had caught anything. It could be a rather disappointing prospect for somebody to ask you of your success in fishing when you've had none. It can be a bit frustrating and even a bit embarrassing. And so the response is very short and to the point. No. <laughs> well, he instructs them in verse 6 to cast the net on the right side of the ship. In other words, do it my way and you'll have success. And no sooner do they cast the net than they're slammed with a massive haul of fish. John, looking at the massive haul of fish, replays the audio that he had just heard from this man on shore and immediately connects the pieces. It's the Lord. He immediately proclaims this. That's the perception of John. That's what Jesus loved about John was his perception. This was a telltale sign of Jesus, this miracle. Peter's heard enough. He puts on his coat. And Thayer in his lexicon tells us that, that was the overcoat that a fisherman would wear. And when he was fishing, he would lay it off and just be in his undergarments, as the term naked here means in the record. And so he would put that on, jump into the water, and Peter's off swimming in the 100-meter swim. And so I was curious, well, how long would this take for Peter to swim to shore? And so I looked up what the world record was, 47 seconds is what the world record was. And given his performance in the sprint to the tomb, I don't think he would have been setting any world records. But Peter would have been thrashing away to get to Jesus because he wanted to be with Jesus. It would have been exhausting, though. Over a minute, probably, of swimming, fully clothed, and Peter emerges on the shore, panting, and up behind him comes the boat in verse 8. The boat that was full of the fish, dragging this net behind them. But note the first thing that John notices as the boat pulls to shore. Jesus was preparing a meal. And what was he preparing it on? Then none other than a fire of coals. There's only one other time in the Bible where this term fire of coals comes up. And it's John 18 and verse 18. In the house of the high priest's servant or the house of the high priest, rather, of where G Peter is gathered with the servants around that fire as he's questioned and interrogated regarding his affiliation with Jesus. I believe what Peter didn't realize at this time was that he was about to experience again that night, to be reinterrogated regarding his loyalty to Christ. But I don't think it's quite sunk in yet. Because in the fervor of the activity, in the excitement of the moment, 
Peter is just thrilled to see Jesus. He's thrilled that this miracle has taken place. And Jesus doesn't want them to lose sight of the miracle. In verse 11, he tells them to go and get the fish. And Peter jumps up. He's first to act again. We're told in verse 11 that Peter brings them up by himself. Don't worry about it, guys. I got this. 153 great fish, every single one of them. Three, four, five hundred pounds of fish. I don't know, but Peter is hauling the whole thing up by himself. Indicative of the physical stature of this man. He's used to doing things himself and in his own strength. And Jesus concludes this section by saying as much in verse 18. When he says, when you were young, you girded yourself. You did the things that you wanted to do in your strength. It won't always be that way, Peter. But he's got to work, Peter, to that point. I just want to pause for a moment and address a speculation that some have had of Peter at this moment suggesting that Peter was just reverting back to an old way of life, out of spiritual despondency, that he was going back to being a fisherman. But consider the context of this event. Think about the events that had just transpired before this. Peter had just wept bitterly, a little more than a week before, as he had denied his best friend three times, letting him down in the hour when he needed him most. He had just experienced a special visit from Jesus himself, post-resurrection. He was in Galilee. Now the whole reason that he was there is because Jesus had told him to go to Galilee. He's excited to see Jesus. He jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. There's nothing here of embarrassment, of him being caught doing the wrong thing, because you contrast this event with the one that we looked at in Luke chapter 5. Remember the response in Luke chapter 5. He's caught. His attitude is in the wrong place. His priorities are not aligned. And he falls at the feet of Jesus. I'm a sinful man. That's not the case here. There's no apology. Peter is excited to see Jesus. So what would be a plausible explanation then? Well, they would have had to provide for their natural needs at some level. Because what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Jesus was seen of over 500 brethren at once. Is this the location of where they were seen by over 500 brethren? Perhaps Peter, knowing that there was a need, said, well, we need to eat. Perhaps we should use our trade to feed ourselves. Paul the Apostle did that with the making of tents. Perhaps Peter was doing the same as well. A natural consideration, whether it was 500 or the 11 of them, Jesus had taught them up to this point in the feeding of the 5,000 that it was their job. You give them something to eat. And perhaps that's what Peter is doing here. But now the minds of the disciples are being elevated above food to think about higher things. 153 fish is what they had gathered in. And Jesus was reminding them that they were to be fishers of men. The words of John chapter 6 and verse 39 come to mind. Of all that his father had given him, he should lose nothing. That's the mindset that he wanted them to have as they went out on their new commission. That of everything that God had given them, they should lose nothing. But setting these fish to the side, Jesus goes in to have a meal with his disciples in verse 12. Come and dine. And nobody needs to ask who he is because everybody knows at this point that it's Jesus. It's very likely that in the flurry of activity, swimming to shore, seeing the miraculous haul of fish, being with Jesus that Peter really didn't appreciate at this point, the setting that was being placed before him. But as the meal died down, we're told that Jesus directs his attention specifically to Peter. Think about Peter having just jumped into the water fully clothed. It's the morning, probably a little bit cooler. And perhaps now his adrenaline had worn off. Now, maybe, he had moved to the fire of coals to try to warm himself. And so now we have Jesus and Peter and a fire of coals. And so the questions begin. Jesus says to him, Simon Peter, or rather Simon, son of Jonas. 
And with this introductory inquiry, where would Peter's mind have gone? Remember every time that Simon, son of Jonah, comes up, that there's a learning opportunity that's being presented to him. What's about to transpire? Well, look at what he asks him. Do you love me more than these? Many of us are familiar that there's two different Greek words that are being used here regarding love. One is agape, a self-sacrificing love. And the other is philio, a deep affection, a deep friendship, an authentic friendship with another. Jesus uses both of these terms here, as we'll see in a moment. The initial question that he asks him is, Peter, do you have this self-sacrificing love for me more than your brethren? Are you willing to die for me more than your brethren? Remember what Peter had claimed in Matthew 26, verses 33 to 35. Though all should be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. I'm more loyal than all of these other disciples. Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. I'm ready to die with you, Jesus. Jesus asks him, Peter, are you still at the point of where you think that you're willing to die for me? more than your fellow disciples? What could Peter answer? Peter doesn't answer with this self-sacrificing love. He answers in the way that he could, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. That's what filio means. You know that I'm your friend. He couldn't honestly say that he was willing to give his life more than anyone else. So Jesus says, feed my lambs. These would have been the very young, innocent, and immature in the ecclesia, it wasn't enough just to be a fisher of men. He needed to feed the young to the truth. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues on, but he dials it back a bit. It appears at first glance that these three questions are the same, but they're not. There's a slight difference in each one that's meant to address the three assertions that Peter had made on the night of the betrayal. The second question that he asks him removes the element of the brethren. It still has this agape love, but he says now, Peter, are you still willing to die for me? Are you ready to die for me, Peter? Is that still where you think that you're at in terms of being personally prepared to do that? But unable to confirm his personal readiness in this regard, Peter replies in an identical fashion, yes, Lord, you know that I'm your friend. He still can't bring himself to honestly say that, yes, I'm ready to die for you, Lord. Jesus tells him here to feed his sheep, the mature of the flock. But this is a different word for feed. It's actually one of tending or leading. So, Peter, not only do I need you to feed the young, but I need you to tend and to lead the mature of the flock. You can see what the responsibilities are in terms of how they grow and what Jesus' expectation is of Peter. Well, at this point, Peter must have known that the third question was coming. He must have thought, I deserve this after what I've done. But this wasn't punishment, brothers and sisters. This was Jesus helping Peter to realize what he had already realized before. Isn't that the purpose of trials? To bring to the surface so that we can see what God already sees inwardly. But I don't believe that Peter was ready for the slight twist that the Lord puts into this third question. Because it's no longer a self-sacrificing love, Jesus replaces it with filio. Peter, are you even my friend? Imagine how these words would have hit Peter. Peter, are you even my friend? And Peter can't even reply in the affirmative. He just appeals to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know I'm your friend. And he appeals to Jesus to recognize him as his friend. As Peter was challenged to recognize Jesus around the fire before. Look at what Jesus says to him now. Feed the mature. Feed the sheep. Peter, feed the young. Lead the mature and feed the mature. This is what being a shepherd looks like. Peter, when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. And in each of these three questions, 
each of these three questions addresses one of those assertions of his self-confidence. Do you really think that you're better than your brethren? The second aspect of readiness. Do you really believe that you personally are ready to die? And the third, in terms of loyalty, are you really even my friend? But what should Peter do about it? Now that Peter sees what his Lord had seen, he needs to follow the advice that Jesus had given him before. On that night in Luke 22 and verse 32, to go on and to strengthen his brethren. Just think about the profundity of this for a moment. How committed are you to me, Peter? Are you willing to give your life for me? Are you still my friend? And as Peter reflects on these things, he says, you want to be near me, Peter? He knew that this was the defining characteristic of Peter. He says, if you want to be my friend, if you love me, then feed my sheep. Show that love in the way that you treat your brothers and sisters. This is the take-home message for the conversion of Peter, that it wasn't about him being personally close to the Lord, showing that he was more committed than others, that he was doing more than others. It was about being concerned for their walk to the kingdom. We tend to focus on the things that we are doing in the truth, and we find ourselves very busy, very consumed with our activities and our service, but never confuse activity with productivity. We can be very busy, but what is the purpose of it? Are we helping other people to the kingdom? What are we trying to achieve? We each have to undergo this conversion of where we see beyond personal achievement to look to the cares and the concerns and the needs of our brothers and sisters. We tend to worry about how we are going to get to the kingdom. And what Jesus is telling Peter here is the way that you will come to me, the way that your salvation will be gained is by serving your brothers and sisters. Peter was a disciple that was full of activity. He was always first to act, first to speak, first to lead. But Jesus needed to, him to focus his efforts, to focus his energies on getting his brothers and sisters into the kingdom. Well, I believe that this is why Jesus follows up this threefold questioning with the words of verse 18, of where he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. He tells Peter, when you were young, you did the things that you wanted to do. You relied on yourself. But Peter, you need to develop beyond that to where you're depending on me, to where you're relying on me. Peter's telling, being told that eventually he's going to submit to the will of God. Look at the imagery here, that he would stretch forth his hands. He would be carried where he didn't want to go, signifying by what death he should die. And I believe that as Peter stood there watching his Lord speak and his Lord illustrating to him what that meant, that they would stretch out his hands, that Peter's eyes would travel along his Lord's arm to his hand and he would see the witness marks of what his Lord had endured as his arms had been stretched out. And Peter would see his future in the hands of his Lord. Peter, I believe, made this connection, as we can see from even more than 30 years in the future, in 2 Peter 1, verse 14. Shortly, he says, I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. He was shown in real terms what it was that he was going to have to endure. And even from history, we can see in Eusebius Ecclesiastical History, written A.D. 325, that it was accounted that Peter was crucified upside down. And every time that John uses this phrase in his account of the gospel, signifying by what death, in John 12, in John 18, and in John 21, it speaks of the crucifixion. Peter made this connection that this is what his future was. 
to die a death similar to his Lord. But as Peter prepares to follow his Lord, as he was just instructed, he becomes distracted and he turns, as we're told in verse 20. Now that word turn is the same word as converted. That's what Jesus had instructed him to do. When you are converted, when you make that U-turn, strengthen your brethren. And now that he's been converted and ready to follow his Lord, he's almost converted back again. He's looking backward. He sees another disciple. John, he says, well, what about this disciple? Jesus politely tells him to mind his own business. He says, what is that to you? What is it if he continues on till I return? Follow me. How easy is it for us, brothers and sisters, to get distracted by somebody else's discipleship? We're all very good at finding all the other areas that our brothers and sisters can improve upon if they would just listen to us. But how does that help us in our discipleship? How does that help us to draw closer to our Lord? And the answer of Jesus here is, it doesn't. Comparison and contrasting one with another is pre-conversion behavior, is what Jesus is telling us here. Post-conversion is strengthening our brethren, focusing on Christ, walking after Him, and leading our brethren. And so the picture closes out here with Jesus leading and Peter following. Peter had previously made the commitment to follow his Lord, but he hadn't yet been converted. Now Peter was a converted man. He would never look back again. Sure, there would be adjustments that would need to be made. I'm sure it would be great if things were binary in life, wouldn't it? Of where we get baptized and we never do the wrong thing again. But that's not the case. And we know that there's corrections that have to be made in Peter's life. But look at the resolve that Peter has as he goes into the Acts of the Apostles. He gets dragged in front of the Sanhedrin, as we'll look at tomorrow. There's no doubt And what Peter's going to say, you tell me what I should do. Should I listen to you or should I listen to God? The very people that he was denying Jesus in front of before, he doesn't need to think twice in terms of where his allegiance is. Like an overhanging rock, he would provide shelter to those who were following Jesus. And through his apostleship, he would lay the foundation in the early book of Acts for that early ecclesia using the keys to unlock the kingdom to the Jews and to the Gentiles. However, it wouldn't be through a confidence in self that that foundation would be laid. It would be through the Lord Jesus Christ that Peter would be able to conquer. Prior to Peter's conversion, his boldness is something that we often cringe at. We think, here's Peter again, jumping first and thinking later, and we begin to cringe of, oh, how could he do this? We think of a boldness that leads to impetuosity, which is some kind of shortcoming, some deficiency that needs to be overcome. But it's this very boldness, when applied properly and channeled properly, that probably becomes the defining feature of why he could be that rock, why he could be that bedrock for so many brothers and sisters, and why he could take the brunt of a lot of the abuse that the early ecclesia would suffer. Even the best skills, the best talents, when improperly motivated, will bring about undesirable results. And in the beginning, Peter used that talent, that ability, that charisma that God had given him in a way that really wasn't properly motivated. In the beginning, it was more about Peter. But when Peter was converted to think about his brethren and to place them first, that boldness was able to be channeled in a way that could not be stopped that nobody could turn around, that nobody could break. There comes a point in all of our lives of where we need to be converted in our hearts. And it's only at that point that we can truly strengthen our brethren. Some of us may be thinking, well, I've been baptized for years, maybe even decades. Of course I'm converted. Peter probably thought the same thing after being in the Lord's presence day in and day out for three and a half years, personal face-to-face contact with the Lord for three and a half years. And even Peter struggled with this element of conversion. Conversion can only occur when we empty ourselves of ourselves 
And it's only then that we can realize our inherent weakness and put our confidence in God. But how do we know if we're truly converted? Wouldn't that be great if we could just have some kind of litmus test that would tell us, look, converted or not converted, and could identify the things that we need to do? The problem is it's very difficult to see the root, isn't it? Because the root is quite often underground. But what about the fruit? What does the fruit of our lives reveal to us about our degree of conversion? What is the fruit that Jesus looks at in regards to conversion? Is it not whether or not we're strengthening our brethren? Strengthen your brethren is the fruit that Jesus identifies to Peter. So look at your own interactions. I'll look at my interactions and consider recently do our interactions with our brothers and sisters have the result of strengthening them toward the kingdom? Do we look at it with that level of intentionality of where every single interaction that we have with each other should be strengthening and moving us closer to the kingdom? That doesn't mean that conflict doesn't arise, but there's a way to have constructive conflict. There's a way to do it in a way that builds up others and strengthens toward the kingdom that needs to govern the things that we talk about, the things that we find ourselves doing, the ways that we entertain ourselves, all need to be done in a way that bring each other closer to the kingdom. What do the results of my interactions with others reveal about my level of conversion? And how often do I consciously think about how I can be proactively helping my brothers and sisters? We're all very busy, aren't we? We all get consumed with the things that we have to do. But we need to be thinking about others. We need to be extending ourselves to help others to the kingdom. In Peter's youth and the truth, he really focused on his own expectation of what it was that the kingdom meant to him personally, what his job would be, what his role would be. His foundation was his personal ability. But when we approach God from this perspective on all the things that we're going to do to show our loyalty to Christ, it ends up, without even realizing it, creating a behavior of where we contrast ourselves against our brothers and sisters. Because if the criteria is how much we are doing, then we begin to look at what others are doing. Whereas if the criteria is how effectively are we bringing others along to the kingdom, then we will be looking at it much more from a collaborative mindset than this comparison and contrasting. Here in John 21, Jesus points out to Peter that he's in the same position as the rest of his brethren. And it's only then that he can begin to lead. Well, I believe that Peter digested these words that Jesus spoke to him in a very real way. And he emphasizes this to the brothers and sisters as he writes some of his final words in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18, he tells them how it is that they were redeemed, that they were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what they should do as a result. He says in verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Remember these two forms of love, filial love, agape love. These were the two types of love that he had been questioned regarding in John 21. He brings these two types of love together in this verse. This unfeigned love of the brethren, Anapocritos Philadelphia, a non-hypocritical brotherly love, an authentic friendship based on God's word. How do we develop an authentic friendship based on God's word? He continues on in the verse that we love one another with a pure heart fervently, that we have a self-sacrificing love with no ulterior motives. But what's the enabler for doing that? Is it just sheer willpower? He says, no, we need to be born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The enabler is undergoing a conversion, a transformation. And as Peter looked at his own life, an older man at this point, 
he could see that this conversion had taken place in his life. He says, for all flesh is grass. As he looked at his abilities that he had, the strength that he had in his former years, those things had dissipated like grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Peter could see that naturally, that there was not much left of him naturally. But that didn't mean that he was empty. That didn't mean that there was nothing that remained. Peter said, the word of God abides forever. Make that your foundation. Get that inside of your mind and allow that to transform you into what you need to be. These are the keys to success, is what he was exhorting the brethren. But I'd like to conclude by considering one final aspect of this connection, to see how Peter brings us to life. Sometimes we wonder, what is a self-sacrificing love? What are the limits of that self-sacrificing love? But Peter puts one word in here that helps to qualify for, that, for us a little bit of what that means. And that one word here at the end is fervently. That comes from a verb meaning to stretch out the hand. And it has the imagery of one stretching out and help to somebody else. But this wasn't a word that Peter just came up with on his own. These were the words that the Lord Jesus Christ had spoken to him regarding what lay in his future. In John 21 and verse 18, he says, But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. That's the verb from where this word comes from in 1 Peter, to stretch out the hand. And so as Peter lived the rest of his life, he lived it in a way of where he was stretching for his brethren. We've all stretched before, and you can feel the muscle stretching to the limit. And Peter says to keep stretching, to keep stretching, to keep pushing, to reach out for your brethren. This is the way that Peter lived his life, to stretch and stretch and continue stretching for others. And because Peter lived his life in this way, when he was put to death in this fashion, it glorified God. This is the death by which he would glorify God, is what Jesus told him. And so in this case, we have Peter's life encapsulated by the Spirit and Peter's death commemorated in the way that he died. Peter's death would glorify God because it represented the way that he lived after he was converted. His hands stretched out in obedience, following the will of his master. So what have we learned from this aspect of Peter's life and Peter's conversion? We've been reminded from the post-resurrectional experience of Peter that God will forgive us if we're willing to change, that we become our biggest hurdle to moving forward. We have to accept God's forgiveness we have to believe that God can forgive us no matter what we've done. Peter denied Jesus three times in the presence of his enemies. But Jesus' role for Peter didn't change. God's promises remain the same. When he was questioned by Galilee, it wasn't just to interrogate Peter for no reason as punishment. It was to help him see where he needed to improve. That a true love for Christ is shown in the way that we treat each other. This is the criteria for the judgment. At the end of Matthew 25, when the judge is standing there, judging between the sheep and the goats, it's all based on how they've treated their brethren as manifesting the name and the character of God. As Peter reflected on his own conversion, he really emphasizes the need for us to empty ourselves of ourselves and to stretch for each other, to proactively look for ways to help each other to the kingdom. It's a process, isn't it, brothers and sisters, of calling an election, of commitment and conversion. But the fact is that God will convert us if we're willing to change and if we're willing to stretch for others. So whenever you wonder if you've done enough for your children, if you've done enough for your brothers and sisters, remember this image 
Remember this example, this stretching out, and continue to stretch, continue to reach for your brothers and sisters, because it's when we do so that our own conversion and that our own salvation will be gained by the grace of God. And so as we move forward, we'll see how Peter uses these elements in the Acts of the Apostles to spread the word to the early ecclesia and to unlock the gospel message both to Jew and to Gentile.